So we've moved on from talking about the act requirements for rape and sexual assault, and now I want to focus on mens rea. But as it turns out, and we'll see this especially true in, in our second, or I guess it's our third case today, uh, courts are prone to mix up mens rea and act requirements when it comes to consent. And we want to try to figure out why and how we can avoid that mistake that courts often um, you know, commit in analyzing these fact patterns and the law applicable to them. Uh, so since we had three possible act requirements, two that are in every rape statute and then one that's, um, you know, possible, the force requirement, uh, we want to also look at mens rea for each. Um, but as it turns out, two of the act requirements, the mens rea cases or issues are just less involved or less frequently appear in, in case law. Uh, so we'll start there with uh, mistake of fact uh, or a mens rea um, argument relevant to the sex act of the crime. Um, now, Louisiana versus Trackling is, you know, an unusual fact pattern. It's technically an attempt case, which is where you'd expect these sort of fact patterns to emerge, where there's some confusion about the sex act being mentioned. Uh, but it also gives us some information both about the act requirement and the fact that Louisiana at the time of this case defined the act narrowly, and then therefore the defendant was allowed to escape uh, criminal liability for violation of the statute by arguing that they uh, did not intend uh, to commit one of the covered sex acts under the rape statute. So in Trackling, again, we see a court looking at a lot of contextual factors that aren't clearly on point, but the opinion's uh, relatively uh, brief. And at the end of the day, uh, what the uh, victim says is that there was an agreement uh, between the victim and the defendant to have sex and the defendant uh, statement that he only ever wanted um, oral sex, which was not included within uh, the Louisiana rape statute. And we also have a, uh, both parties agree that during a struggle, uh, when uh, the victim was resisting and, uh, trying to escape, uh, the defendant said, you're going to suck my thing, uh, which seemingly indicates, uh, that it was oral sex that was intended. And when the police entered the house, which itself is extremely unusual in a rape case, but it's why we have this sort of fractured fact pattern where we don't know how to predict the future uh, with high degree of certainty, uh, the only clothes uh, that the victim had had removed was her top. And so it's unclear from that uh, whether or not uh, there was going to be any sexual activity uh, intended by the defendant uh, below the belt. Um, but so even though this is a situation where we definitely have force, we definitely have non-consent, there is a mens rea issue as to um, the intended sex act. And so the court overturns the conviction uh, here. And it also, because it was a, a multiple offender sentence, uh, it's a 50 year penalty actually gets uh, removed here. So it's quite a big difference. And, you know, as I said, you know, these cases don't come up frequently, but it shows you how a basic mens rea rule that we've already looked at before will be applied in the specific instance, albeit with an attempt uh, dynamic added in it as well. Um, for the more difficult mens rea issues, we look into this category of mistake of consent or mistake of incapacitation. Now, I don't actually have a mistake of incapacitation case, but I will talk about how that you can draw lessons from these two cases to apply it in that context. Uh, but the general idea here is uh, how are we going, or I guess I should say the general problem here is how do we instruct jurors in mens rea in this area? Since we're you know focusing on common law rules in this chapter because the NPC's datedness, uh, we'll leave aside questions of purpose, reckless, uh, negligence and knowledge and instead just focus on mistakes of fact. And so if that were, you know, if that's our universe here, um, we might think, well, should it be a specific intent crime? Should it be a general intent crime? There are some jurisdictions that claim cons non-consent is strict liability, but that's not really true. It's just they take all the mens rea issue and jam them into the act requirement of non-consent. And so, yeah, there is some confusion uh, on this, but let's look through our cases and then I'll try to, you know, go back through uh, our doctrine here and make sense of it. And of course, it, because the real world is uh, not the the world that we sometimes, the, the cleaner world of law that we uh, address in class, uh, the Utah case itself that we start with 
shows a blending of common law and uh, MPC doctrine. Um, so in this case, we have a, a defendant who was a masseuse at a massage MB. Uh, if you don't know massage MB, it is a large massage chain nationwide. Um, I've sometimes referred to it as the Applebee's of uh, massage uh, studios. So this is not some sort of local uh, studio. It's It's got, you know, very corporate policies, corporate environment. Um, and importantly, although it's it's not really re clear how it would matter in this case. This is not an instance where a massage parlor is a front uh, for some form of sexual activity, uh, prostitution, sex work of any sort. Uh, this is just a, a massage chain. And our uh, victim, KM, here goes into uh, the studio and uh, Barella you know, is giving her a massage. You'll notice again, like several other cases, the court is giving a lot of information about discrepancies between the victim and the defendant. And this should, again, strike you as odd because once we have a jury verdict and a conviction, which we have here, then we should be deferring to the facts in favor of the government, in favor of that jury verdict. And so when, you know, the defendant says that the victim made certain overtures to him that the victim denied, that shouldn't be part of the analysis. And yet, here it is, uh, yet again. Um, now, the actual interaction here, um, there is agreement, and we shouldn't even care that there's agreement, but let's just, for the sake of, you know, ignoring a lot of the the factual discussion, and then we'll talk about facts that we should construe in favor of the government, but the agreement that there was no um, verbal communication or even a really strong nonverbal signal uh, that uh, the victim wanted to be penetrated by uh, the defendant. And so when she's on the massage table and a massage you know environment presents certain unusual dynamics because people, or at least the, the client, is nude or nearly nude. And so uh, the possibility of penetration is at least easier to accomplish for a defendant. And then uh, the victim in this case freezes. Um, and this is not an unusual response. And interestingly, uh, this is something that is acknowledged in uh, the Utah jury instructions and some of their statutory language. In other words, non-consent can be established through freezing, which does seem to be a little bit of an uh, exception to the negative consent model, but it, it, it's also a recognition that uh, people manifest um, you know, shock and uh, anger and all the emotions that, that uh, occur during a uh, immense personal violation, such as a rape, in very different ways. And so here, the fact that uh, she uh, freezes is something the law contemplates from an act requirement standpoint. But from mens rea standpoint, well, that, that gets trickier because the defendant, you know, wants to say, well, I, I thought this was consensual. And freezing might just appear as, you know, uh, compliance, right? In other words, going along with the activity as part of, um, you know, whatever uh, was intended. Uh, and so we might think that the defendant has a pretty good or at least a viable um, make mistake of fact argument or mens rea argument. Um, but as it turns out, uh, the court's, after going through all these facts and casting doubt on the victim's story, they end up resolving it in a rather curious manner that's relevant to mens rea, but not in the way that lots of our cases resolve. So if you look at the top of page 339, uh, we see the jury instruction in the case, instruction 13, I should say one of the jury instructions. It says, one, the defendant, Robert K. Barea, Barella, I should say, uh, two, intentionally or knowingly, three, had sexual intercourse with KM, Four, that said act of intercourse was without consent of KM. The court here uh, believes the defendant's argument that this created some potential confusion because intentionally and knowingly might modify both uh, the third part, having sexual intercourse, and the fourth part uh, without consent, or it might only modify the third part. And yeah, this is, this is not an ideal uh, um, jury instruction. I also don't like the fact that the court refers to each of these as four different elements, because these are not different elements of the crime. One element is not the person's name. Uh, mens rea without modifying an crime is not an element. So yeah, the court's construction of this is also uh, problematic. I mean, here, not the, the high court, not the, the trial court. 
Um, and so you might be like, well, yeah, isn't this kind of reasonable? We don't know if the jurors applied mens rea properly. Well, there also was instruction 14, uh, which, you know, doesn't address um, uh, freezing, uh, but it does give more information about consent. And this is a series of instructions that, you know, at the end of the day, as I said, it's not ideal, but it's not clear that this is the type of problematic error that would result in a reversal in any other context. Um, I showed this jury instruction to many different people and my colleagues and my faculty, both very pro-government, former prosecutors, defense, and all of them said, oh, no, there's nothing wrong with that jury instruction. I mean, if, if that jury instruction is bad, then, you know, we have to throw out so many convictions because jury instructions are just going to be imprecise and they're not always going to be uh, expressed uh, in the manner that we would hope, um, particularly when they can't just use the model instructions. But even if you don't buy that, I included footnote three on the bottom page of 340, which is... I don't want to say hilarious, but it's, it's insane. I don't know the word here. In response, the state asserts that the Court of Appeals upheld a similar instruction in State versus Marchette. But the instruction in the case differed from the one here in a crucial respect. The mens rea element was listed last after the sexual intercourse to non-consent elements. That instruction at least arguably suggests the mens rea applies to all of the above listed elements. So we proceed on the ground that Marchette is distinguishable and without reaching the question on whether the instruction in this case was an accurate statement of law. So uh, there was an instruction like this, except two was moved down to the bottom and three and four slid up. Um, a, they're distinguishing it because in fact, you can distinguish any two things that are not exactly alike. But how this is a distinction with a difference, a legal difference, is a little harder to say. If you actually read what that other instruction said, intentionally knowingly being at the bottom, I mean, it's not clear it modifies anything at all. Um, and it's, you know, I can't imagine why it's any better uh, than the current one. If anything, it just uh, is nonsensical uh, and might confuse the jurors entirely. So the distinction the court draws between its prior case law here, I have to say, is, is lacking. Um, but, you know, we also have, a, a, you know, we've seen cases throughout the semester where even if there's error, you know, the court decides it's harmless error. And I'm not saying necessarily this is harmless error, but there is an incredible amount of evidence here against the defendant. And, um, you know, this is the, the, since we know, at least based on either theory, that the defense, uh, the jurors disbelieve the defendant's story, we can say the, the facts as construed in favor of the government still point towards a non-consensual sexual penetration. Indeed, uh, the dissent here, um, you know, says that, yeah, um, the it would have been nice if the defendant's uh, lawyer objected to the jury instruction. Uh, but overall, there's still an enormous amount of evidence here. I also do want to point out, and this is something that is beyond the criminal law course, it is extremely rare, extremely rare to see a conviction overturned based on a faulty jury instruction that was not objected to at the time of the trial. That means that the error has to be just absolutely clear, and it makes this majority holding even more questionable. Um, but, you know, if, if Utah wanted to be consistent across the board and just saying any flawed jury instruction will reverse, that'd be one thing. But... That is not uh, uh, the, their general take on these sorts of matters. And so the dissent are, looks at, you know, the case, the facts and says, you know, once you get rid of all the contradictions in favor of the government, um, seems like reasonable jurors can look at this and say that uh, the defendant uh, had mens rea that using the MPC language here that seems to be purpose, knowing or and or reckless, which is what they uh, um want to evaluate. Uh, if we were to use this from a stake of fact perspective, we would say, did the defendant honestly know in a specific intent standard or honestly and reasonably know? And so, yeah, once we've, you know, looked at the facts and, and construed all the details and contradictions in favor of the government, I think there's a much clearer case. But the, the court overturns the conviction here. Of course, there is the possibility of retrial, but as uh, I talked about with our Massachusetts v. Blodge case, this case was also never retried. Uh, when I looked into the news in the background, again, the victim said after dealing with this for years and dealing with the justice system that she felt had done wrong, she did not want to continue with the, the case anymore. And since she is the state's only witness uh, of, you know, that has direct evidence uh, on the matter, um, it didn't go uh, back to trial. And so this is, you know, something that uh, shows that the mens rea rules here um, are not necessarily well-defined. And there is this problem of how do we address freezing uh, 
at a men's rate level. Because from the act requirement, we can incorporate that, recognizing that some people freeze in reaction to a non-consensual sexual activity. But if we're going to say the defendant has to be aware that that freezing indicates non-consent, well, that becomes much trickier to do. And so this is, you know, a fact pattern that shows one implication of uh, negative consent, no means no, because there's sort of a default rule that you're consenting until you say otherwise. The problem of freezing and reaction. And again, we might look at this case and say, there's something going on here besides the law. This is not just a court applying black letter law to simple factual pattern. No, this is an instance where the court seems to be engaging in rape exceptionalism. They're looking at a rape case and deciding it in a manner different than they would decide any other one. And I have to say the jury instruction is, is pretty, pretty thin, uh, um, gruel to, to overturn a conviction here. It is not, uh, that surprising. Of a, of a, you know, ambiguity. It's the type of thing that gets overlooked hundreds of times in a year in a jurisdiction. And given their prior case law in this area, which had a slightly different, you know, ordering of the phrase and the fact that this uh, jury instruction was not objected to a trial, we should think maybe this is a, a rape exceptionalism instance. Okay. Now let's get to our last case. So this is a case that you know, I've, I debate sometimes whether to include it in the book because it technically hinges on a legal issue that is beyond criminal uh, um, law and because it's about evidence rules and it's about the admission of prior bad acts. There are two reasons I decided to include it despite these reservations. One is uh, prior bad act evidence. There's actually a special rule in jurisdictions, although it's not the one at issue here, about sex crimes and about sex offenses that um, make them admissible even when they don't establish a pattern. So there is something connected to the substance here. But the second and perhaps more important reason why I include it is I think the dissent does a great job of explaining the errors and reasoning of the majority, the types of errors that I want you to avoid. And it just happens that they come up in an evidence focused case as opposed to a substantive law focused case. And so I've decided to keep it, but I know it's, it's something that's, you know, you're going to stretch yourself, but it's near the end of the semester. And so it's a little, little different than you're used to looking at. Um, so the difficulty in this case, you know, concerns the fact that the defendant clearly seems to have a pattern, right? Where he, um, you know, attempts to hire somebody to give him a, private dance at his home. Uh, there is sometimes negotiation, um, you know, about the, the, the financial arrangement and so forth. And then once uh, the uh, would-be victim is there, uh, the defendant asks for sex. Sometimes that can be, you know, given right away, or it can be another negotiation, or the person could refuse. But eventually, uh, it seems the uh, defendant uh, will turn it into a clear forcible rape, right? You know, after this, you know, faux negotiation, everything. Uh, but then can, an even a more unusual part of this pattern uh, is that the defendant uh, then sometimes engages in these, you know, um, dialogues with the victim via phone or immediately after or both where they apologize for what they've done and they, you know, go through this long sort of sob story and try to, you know, justify or contextualize uh, their action. So, you know, in at you know, if this was just one case with, you know, or I'm sorry, if this was an isolated case where uh, the victim had went through all this and this is what happened, we might not think that tells us much about the defendant's men's, or, or I guess we shouldn't say, we, we, we would have doubts about the defendant's mens rea, I guess is the best way to phrase, at least arguably reasonable doubts that maybe they didn't you know, intend for this to be non-consensual. Um, maybe they were, you know, dealing with a lot of emotional trauma and they just didn't have the intentionality that we associate uh, with uh, rape under, say, a specific intent standard. And maybe they were confused about consent. At least there's a, there's a colorable argument in that world. But once we know that the defendant has repeated this process multiple times, well, then we think, well, they're not caught up in their emotions and they're not confused about it because this is their plan, right? They keep doing it over and over and over again. And yet the majority here says that that prior pattern evidence, 
um, which would be admissible whether or not it's a sex crime, there's, you know, evidentiary rules in this, cannot be used to prove mens rea. And they cite this minor versus commonwealth case. If you don't know, Virginia is a commonwealth, one of several, and it insists on referring to itself as a commonwealth and not a state. And so once that evidence is thrown out, it, you know, at a minimum that overturns the conviction, but it makes the case very different for the prosecution to bring again because they won't be able to cite this repetitive cycle of, you know, luring somebody in, abusing them and raping them, and then apologizing. Right. They won't be able to, you know, that none of that will be admissible. The defendant can keep committing these acts and have them being treated as isolated incidents. Um, and the minor case, though, is and I, and I just want to read, you know, the beginning of the dissent here, because I think it hones in exactly what I want you all to think about and why this case is here. So this is Judge uh, McClan Mac McClanahan, sorry, um, uh, who's joined by Judge Kelsey uh, or Justice Kelsey, uh, since this is the high court. Uh, Commonwealth v. Minor held that the crime's evidence has no logical bearing on consent, a function of the rape's victim's state of mind. Minor did not hold, and it specifically disclaimed any intention to hold, that such evidence can never have any bearing on mens rea, a function of the rapist's state of mind. By conflating the two, the majority has done just what the minor, uh, what minor said could not be done. They have blurred two distinct concepts. It's the defendant's intent and the victim's consent. Okay, so what is what is going? There's a lot going on in these sense, but this is the key point here. You know, there is no such thing as victims' mens rea, right? We don't care what a victim's, um, you know, guilty mind. There, there's no such thing. Defendants have mens rea. I mean, they have guilty minds that we associate with criminality. Does that mean the victim's thought processes are irrelevant? No, they're directly relevant to consent. Consent um, can be given or denied in many different ways. Non-consent can be proven in many different ways. So it could be a verbal no. Right? It could be uh, resistance, punching, kicking. Right? Um, but it also can, you know, uh, take, uh, um, you know, any fact-specific form that that indicates communicatively. Um, that no, they didn't intend to. But in fact, non-consent uh, exists in wholly in the victim. We're just using evidentiary proxies of that by looking at their behavior. In other words, their behavior says no, right? Their behavior kicks and punches or whatever other fact we're gonna use to prove non-consent. But the non-consent's actually occurring entirely in the victim's head because that's what establishes they did not want this. Now, that doesn't mean, though, that defendants are automatically guilty because that's why we have act requirements in mens rea. So the act requirement is, should be established merely by evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that the victim didn't want it, whether they communicated that fact or not. Right? That establishes non-consent. The negative consent model confuses this and tries to say it's, it's linked to no means no. But that's really should be pushed into the category of mens rea. And this is partly why I say the affirmative versus negative consent battle is in many ways a red herring. Uh, because in fact, people believe in affirmative consent at certain levels. It's just we have different levels at which we agree with it of activity. But also because the things that the consent standard is different than the mens rea standard. And so here, um, in this case, we have evidence of non-consent from, um, you know, which is the, the victim's resistance and saying no. Uh, and so those are proxies for what's going on in our head. But for the defense, we then look in their head and say, okay, did they understand this? And this is why communication becomes important, right? Because if in the victim's head, they were thinking no, but never gave any signs of this, the effect of the negative consent model in the properly placed mens rea box of analysis is that the defendant could say, I honestly didn't know because they never said no, or I honestly didn't know, and that's a reasonable mistake if we're gonna use a general intent standard. If we're gonna use NPC language, we'd say it wasn't my conscious object to have non-consensual relations, or it wasn't a practical certainty if knowledge is the standard. No matter what rule we use, the consent standard, um, the, the courts you know, will confuse the evidence that's used to prove both, right? say communication saying no, that can prove both the act requirement because it's a proxy for what's going on the victim said and the defendant's mens rea because if they hear no, that's a sign that they uh, had uh, a specific uh, intent to commit the crime. 
And so I think the dissent's right here that they're they're blurring these concepts. They're almost treating like all thought processes here are interlinked in some way. They're thinking of consent as a mutuality requirement, right? That it has to be proven both people didn't consent. I mean, it's not always clear why courts make this error, but it happens over and over and over again. And I think if you, you know, after reading that introduction to the dissent, go back and read the majority opinion again, you know, notice that they slip from talking about the defendant to the victim as though they're, you know, two different parties on trial here, right? That they're both subject to the same sort of mens rea scrutiny, but that's not how it works at all. We have a standard for act requirements, which is totally different than our standard for mens rea. And you shouldn't use the same lens or the same tool to analyze the victim as you defend it, because you wouldn't in any other context. You wouldn't in any other type of crime. This is, again, showing some sort of rape exceptionalism. They're treating differently here. And I think as the dissent goes on, this evidence definitely bears on uh, the defendant's mens rea and should be admissible to that because it tells us that this is not a, you know, don't want to necessarily use heat of passion because in this context it can sound confusing and it's not actually our standard, but some sort of emotional disturbance or state of mind that's atypical, meaning they're not in, you know, operating in all cylinders, they're not intending everything, they're confused morally, that those those defense theories fall away once we know that this is part of a pattern. And so, yeah, I think that we, we shouldn't, our system, always be hesitant to admit prior bad acts, although there is an exception for this in the area of sex crimes, which is alarming for this reason. But this is exactly one of those cases where prior bad acts should be admissible because they tell us something about what's going on in the defendant's uh, um, head, right? Whether it's, you know, hiring a dancer or an escort or whoever to come to their place and going through this cycle, um, this is, you know, very um, cruel, it's premeditated, and it shows intentional conduct. And once you exclude that evidence, this creates an environment where a defendant can repeat their crime over and over and over. And as long as jurors aren't persuaded and, and of the, you know, guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, because they can raise some little bit of hint, you know, that, you know, this wasn't their strong intention and that they were emotionally disturbed at the time, then they will be found not guilty and go on to the next victim. Even though, as an outsider, we should all look at this and say, "What? why are we letting this defendant escape? We know what he's doing. So this is another case that gives us information about mens rea, although in an indirect fashion. Um, but I think it's valuable because the dissent gives us, points out the errors that I want you to avoid uh, across the board, not just in these sort of evidentiary cases. But we'll talk about this more in class. I'm going to leave the mens rea of force um, uh, portion for class because it's really just a hypothetical. Um, so it's much like our, our film clips. And so we'll analyze that uh, there as well. So. Um, next time, we'll move to the category of strict liability rape, statutory rape, uh, which is primarily focused on uh, sex with underage persons, which is a form of rape and is not um, considered consensual sexual activity.